<laughs> you could have told. Hi, everyone. I was waiting for. <laughs> I was just waiting for it to happen. <laughs> so, um, the the adults are out, and so Scott and Nicole are hosting the the science hour. It's okay. Still... No one's watching yet. I have zero viewers. It's just, so I still need to share the posts. They'll watch later. <laughs> but this part will be recorded, so stop saying the f word. <laughs> I didn't. That's right. I not, did not. There we go. There's the public. I'm I was talking share. about flocculent galaxies. <laughs> Anyone wondering? <laughs> so, oh, so needless to say, Nicole and I are a little tired and have had long days, but we still want to bring you some amazing science um, for the Cosmic Quest Science Hour. To, uh, this week, we'll be discussing the recent eclipse that happened in the Southern Hemisphere and also the celebration of Carl Sagan's life and legacy that was also on November 9th. So we're still uh, sharing everything out. I just gave you the post, the, awesome. the Hangout link. Thank you. So we can track all of your comments. We can stalk your comments about us. Uh, that's a very important part of this. Uh... Hello. Uh, ooh, where should I go? Above. Also, if anyone has any um, any questions, comments, especially um, when we're we'll be asking your for your participation when asking about Carl Sagan on any any quotes that really made a lot uh, meant a lot to you or anything from um, his books, his movie Contact, or the show Cosmos. Anything that really stood out to you and had an impact on you, please feel free to share it with us either over on Twitter using the hashtag Science Hour. Or you can also leave your messages on YouTube or all throughout Google+. Plus. We're actually tracking all those comments as we go along. And we'll be seeing what you have to say and what really impacted you once we get to that topic. All right. So, hi, everyone. This could be the official start um, for the Science Hour for... Uh, Wednesday, November 14th, 2012. I am Nicole Gallucci, and over here, according to my screen, is, is Scott Lewis. I am Scott Lewis. Wave at the people. Hello. Wave at the people on the internet. Um, yes, and as Scott said, we're both slightly tired and silly, and yeah, <laughs> it's, it's unpredictable what may happen in the next hour. It is. <laughs> so I apologize, we... <laughs> and we're not getting fired. Just... We're going to try not to get fired. <laughs> But we will be talking about the uh, the recent solar eclipse, so if you uh, have any eclipse stories to share with us, if you were lucky enough to be on site and still have access to internet <laughs> at the moment. Yes. Uh, if you watched it on the internet, as I did while I was sitting in the doctor's office getting my allergy shots, or um, and also uh, get your, your Carl Sagan quotes and inspiration and stories uh, in mind, because we'll be asking for that in a little bit as we talk about Carl Sagan Day. Absolutely. Now, I I know I'm actually jealous. One of the the faculty I work with here at Citrus College, he he logged in some extra hours over the last few years, so he could go on a cruise to the Pacific, and <laughs> observe the observe the eclipse from a cruise. Which I'm really jealous of you, Dave. And I hope you're having a safe time. But I hope you get eaten by sharks. <laughs> In the best way possible. I mean, I hope they're gentle sharks, but they should nom you. <laughs> but I, I've been speaking with Teal, and I know that Paul Stewart, uh, two of our fantastic astronomers from the Southern Hem Hemisphere, were out observing as well. And I think I have a, a few images from Teal that, that came rolling in. And just magnificent. It's it's very it, it's not very often that we get to see a total eclipse happen. And of course, it happened to be on the other side of the globe at this point. But uh, 2017 is one's coming back to us in North in North America. Now, yeah. one thing I want to already actually official officially invited the entire internet to come crash at my house because uh, the path of totality goes about 30 minutes south of here. Um, so yeah. Party at my house in Illinois. And oh. yes, Nicole lives in a TARDIS. So infinite amount of space. <laughs> anytime show up, odd numbers move down. I have a TARDIS in my living room. In. This is, yes. I have a TARDIS. So you have a TARDIS room. within a TARDIS? Mm -hmm. Isn't, doesn't that it create makes sense. a paradox? No. <laughs> Timey wimey. <laughs> Time, yes, right. Timey wimey. <laughs> wimey. 
but luckily for for those of us that you know could not see the eclipse uh, in person this time around, uh, of course there was a, there were several live streams of the event going on. NASA had one. Uh, the SLU telescope uh, was doing a live stream as well. So when I was watching on my iPad from the doctor's office, um, and and there's been just tons of great images um, that. Uh, of the eclipse. Uh, I've personally never seen one in person, an actual really? solar eclipse. No, I haven't. An actual? An actual those fake, real... so, those fake solar eclipse. Will Just get when you. I put my hand in front of it? Yeah. That... Yes. <laughs> the occultation <laughs> of Nicole's finger. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, Nancy Atkinson posted a, did a post on Universe Today showing some really awesome uh, solar eclipse pictures. So let's see if I can screen share these without breaking the internet. Yeah. Um, you never know with me. And thank you, Nancy. You were awesome. We love you, Nancy. <laughs> so this is uh, as the sun is rising. Um, let me go see, look at the actual thing. I don't have who this picture was by. Ah! Um, this is the, the sun rising while partially eclipsed. That's awesome. Uh, which is pretty impressive. I had a, another window open. I don't know where it went. I was going to give you guys the Universe Today link, but I will find it. Type, 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 type. And it will um, be put up in post as well. So yes. we'll make sure any links we – or we'll, we will try to make sure that any links that we reference to are put up so that you guys can um, peruse them at your own leisure. We'll try and remember. Try. Um, this one was from Robert Hollow at, and uh, CSIRO. So this is from Queensland, Australia. Oh, um, this This uh, eclipse sun rising. And, of course, um, the, the classic oh. diamond ring – uh, I got a lot of likes in the post where I said, this is the only diamond ring I'll ever need. I, I mean it. I really do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and this was posted by Camilla, the rubber chicken, uh, who we Camilla, all know we and love. love. We do, we do. Camilla is is the coolest rubber chicken ever. I met Camilla at the launch of the Solar Dynamics Observatory down nice. in Florida. Yeah, so way back in the day. Um, so Camilla went out to, to view the eclipse as well. Um, there's another super pretty uh, diamond ring picture. Um, this one is also from Robert Hollow at CSIRO. And Jason Major. Hello, Jason. Uh, Jason in... and his images, I swear. He, he, it's <laughs> like he downloads the internet and has someone going through and proves the best things he can ever find. Yeah, well, he said in a screenshot of the video that he was watching, which is exactly what I was watching while I was sitting in the doctor's office getting my allergy shots. And so this is uh, the, the incredible way in which uh, the rest of us can watch all over the world. It was kind of cool because I actually walked outside with my iPad, and I'm watching the eclipse happen on my iPad, and I'm looking up, and there's the sun. And I'm like, I know the moon is really close to it, but I can't see it actually right. seeing where I am, which was pretty which is, which is so cool to think about anyway. I mean, we, we tend not to think in large three-dimensional spaces like that, but you can actually see yeah. live the moon blocking the sun while being on another side of the sphere, and you have a straight path getting all the light. So yeah. um, I was actually going to have a bit of a demonstration since I'm actually in the astronomy lecture hall right now with all of my props of glory Woo! everywhere. But um, un one awesome thing that actually goes on with an eclipse, if I can be a cameraman as well. So <laughs> this is our Earth, and it spins because it's cool. But... What goes on is you know we we have our um, our orbital plane. So we go we go around the sun, 365 days takes one revolution for it. But the moon, which also goes around us, is not on that same path. So I don't know if I can see. I feel like I'm Phil and Pamela <laughs> juggling. But um, at, you know as we're going around the the sun, you know, we also are having the moon going around us all the time. However, since they're not on the same plane, they're never always in the straight path. They might be a little bit above, a little bit below. This is obviously not the scale, but what goes on is that there are two nodes that they do intersect every time that the, the moon goes around the earth. And so they do intersect those two planes and every so often, it just happens to coincide with when you, my lovely audience, are the sun, 
here is the moon, and then here is the earth. And so it's actually completely blocking the, the light coming from the sun. And just by happenstance, the moon is 400 times closer to us than the sun, while the sun is 400 times larger than the moon. So you have this perfect balance to where it, it does a complete total eclipse. And you get to see these beautiful images where you just get to see your diamond ring that, that uh, Tim will never have to buy ever. <laughs> and, but it, it's, it's just amazing on, on the coincidence that's out there that we have these enormously massive planetary bodies that just so happen to be balanced out there with the sun shining on it. And we are able to look up and see that it just passes just perfectly at certain times. But earlier this year, we had our annular eclipse, which we can see that the moon's orbit is not a circle. It's actually an, is an ellipse. And so there's times when it's closer and further away, and which allows us to have our super moon and also have our annular eclipse where you get to see a, a larger ring going on, or in my case, a, a croissant instead of a, a you donut. Get a <laughs> I did a croissant. You got a croissant instead of a donut. It was a very fun croissant hangout. Uh, it was. Exactly. We had a great so. time. Um, Citizen Gold. Hi, Citizen Gold. Uh, this is the uh, Solar Telescope at Carter Observatory in Wellington, New Zealand. Also did a good live presentation. You got to watch the whole thing there. So that's pretty awesome. cool. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm jealous, of course, of those, those eclipse chasers that go after traveling all of them. Um, oh, I, but... I wish. It, unless someone wants to, you know, give me large sums of money so I can just travel and do these awesome things, that'd be great. <laughs> but there are people that do go out and they they chase eclipses and they they find where it's going to be the best. And I, I remember uh, Dr. Pamela Gay giving a, a story of people that were going to China to see this, and it ends up being overcast. So they travel literally across the world for gray skies right. to see this amazing event that they're not going to be able to see, but them's the breaks in astronomy. You know? <laughs> the weather is not your friend. We love our atmosphere so we can breathe and not die, but we hate it when it comes to observing, even when it comes to observing the sun, which is why we have great space telescopes like SDO. I wish I had. Not for Camilla. Oh, I have my Lego, but I have a Lego SDO kit. And it's too far away for me to reach with headphones on. I and mean, also, I, I already took it apart. So, <laughs> but I do have a Lego solar dynamics. Observatory That's awesome. That I love. Yes. We yeah. should all, we, Lego, if you're listening, we need more space kits. Yes. More, more yes. and more and more. I, I did like the one they had for MSL that people made. For the Curiosity Rover. Oh, that's what this really, one is. Really yeah, cool. it was uh, one of the SDO is go uh, participants designed the Lego set. That's <laughs> cool. We ordered a whole bunch. So yeah. yes, scientists are still kids at heart. We love playing mm -hmm. with toys. We love playing with all sorts of gadgets. And <laughs> yeah, we we are twelve on on the inside. As Nicole can attest to all the poop jokes that happen during random <laughs> hangouts. Or not Dorian hangouts. There are a lot of poop jokes, but that's, yeah. There are. <laughs> all right, we're going to move away from the sun and the poop jokes to talk about uh, Carl Sagan Day. I know you went to a really fantastic event uh, a few days ago for a uh, celebration of Carl Sagan Day. It would have been yeah. Carl's uh, 78th birthday. Um, this past weekend. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that that event you had? Oh, it, yeah, it was absolutely wonderful. It was down at the Crawford Family Forum, the, um, the Southern California Public Radio Station, KPCC, um, hosted it there with the Planetary Society. And we, we had Matt Kaplan there, Bruce Betts, and Emily Lakdawalla that, that were there from the Planetary Society, along with an amazing panel of, of people that were sharing their stories of working with Professor Sagan and the way that he personally impacted their lives. So for the first part of the, of the forum there, they were just discussing all the, the, the quirky stories and of the, the funny things when it came down to naming the Planetary Society, because Carl Sagan was a co-founder of the Planetary Society, and they didn't have a name for it. And apparently, 10 minutes before going on to Johnny Carson, he, he, he's like, we need a name for this. And it came down to the last minute before he we went live and the brainstorm and then he shot him down. He came out and just announced it live to the public just mm -hmm. on, on a whim and the, the Planetary Society was born. But 
it it was wonderful getting to to hear from and speak with people that have worked directly with this man that has had such a profound influence on so many lives. I mean, I one that he's majorly known for is his PBS series Cosmos, but the the books that are attributed, you know, with it and all many books that he's written. And then one of my favorite movies, Contact, because, well, there's so many telescopes in it and, and aliens, because aliens are awesome. But it, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> but it, it was wonderful and seeing how many people were involved, you know, and got get to be directly impacted, even executive producers from. Um, from the movie Contact were there and oh, cool. sh- shared the experience of working with him from a different idea than just science, but showing his passion that he had for sharing science with, with the public and trying to get people not just aware of science, but actually curious and engage them and have them take their own steps into understanding. You know, well, we, he can only present the information so much, but if you can spur that curiosity, if if you can want that you know create them to want them to take their steps towards it then 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 they're hooked and so many people have been hooked and that that second part of the forum actually was about newer scientists younger scientists that were affected by professor sagan that brought them into their careers and one of them started off as a ballet dancer that's what she wanted to do for all of her life and it didn't come out that way. She's now working um, on MSL on the Mars mm-hmm. Science Laboratory, and it, it was just fantastic on seeing that sometimes plans don't work out, and there's those fantastic people that leave a huge impact on your life just because they took the time to care to deliver this content in a way that everyone can understand, but everyone can appreciate. Levels of understanding are irrelevant when you can appreciate the the passion behind it. And mm-hmm. uh, D- Carl Sagan definitely had that passion behind what he was wanting to deliver and what he wanted for a better future, especially dealing with in 79, dealing with the Cold War. There's a huge looming threat of our country and, and, and Soviets killing everybody because you know, war is fun, apparently. But there's this looming looming threat going over and advocating for humanity is let's not destroy ourselves. Let's go out and explore the cosmos. And I, I believe there's so many people now that I've been able to work with, and I, I know you have, Nicole, that have been profoundly influenced by Carl and want mm-hmm. to focus on doing remarkable things for the sake of doing it. And I, I know that um, that Carl's had such an effect to cause people to do that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I never met Carl Sagan, unfortunately. Um, I was I was still kind of young when he, he died. Um, but he, I can attribute, yeah, where I am today in my career um, largely to his influence. Um, because I was probably around like 13 or something when Contact came out in theaters. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went to see it in theaters and loved it. And, you know, just watching that, I, I watched the character of Ellie Arroway. And I was already into science, but I was like, oh, I could do that as a career. Like, that's a thing I can do. For, for some reason, watching that movie told me, you know, taught me that I can be an astronomer. Um, and lo and behold, you know, 10 years later, 11 years later, not 11 years later. I don't know. Some years later, I found myself <laughs> at the very, very large array in New Mexico mm-hmm. uh, with some friends. We were out there doing um, an internship as, as radio astronomers, and we were out there at the array. We, we did the, the Ellie pose with the headphones, which I know I've, is I've seen bad. <laughs> I know we don't listen. I am like the biggest advocate of, you know, radio astronomy is light, not sound, but it, it's a fun picture to do. You can't not. Um, so, so that movie had a huge influence on me, um, and we actually ran up and down the stairs pretending I was her, and it was it was ridiculous. Um, I believe that. <laughs> if, if if anyone has met Nicole in person, you would believe that. <laughs> Nicole is brilliant, but she's also crazy, and I'm just crazy <laughs> and bald. So, <laughs> You're crazy and brilliant as well. Don't I'm tell brilliant. yourself short. <laughs> it's, 
I'm just the the bald B word. It's all right. <laughs> well, if I keep screwing up my hair color, I might be bald soon. <laughs> but yeah, we did the running around at the VLA. Um, and the other way he was largely influential is um, I read. Uh, I didn't read this until grad school. Demon Haunted World, which uh, if you, if if you're a part of this whole skeptics community, skeptics movement, this critical thinking movement, um, that is like the book you should read. Uh, right. And that and I and I was dog sitting for my professor who was out of town and he you know one of the fun things about dog sitting was you know a you have the fun adorable dogs to play with but also you have his entire library to read and I picked up Demon Haunted World and and it, it was such a big impact on my life especially because and this was a big thing for me is when I was really young when I was getting into science I was also into some pseudoscience as well I was big into the UFO thing and, and, and aliens and I watched sightings on the sci-fi channel all the time and I was like oh my god the truth is out there Aliens. and that was Aliens. so me right. and and later I became disillusioned with it because it, I couldn't I didn't find anything really compelling any compelling evidence for, for all these stories and and Carl Sagan writes about his experience going through the same exact thing mm -hmm. you know some decades are before me obviously but going through that so it's like oh yeah it, it's 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 not unusual to go through that period of excitement and belief in something that, you know, you may later change your mind and reject. And so that was a big oh, hot I, moment in my life, I, too. Absolutely. And w one thing I found is that it's that journey to facts that is the that is the most important part of it. Knowing stuff really doesn't do you much of any good. It's how you use that knowledge yeah. that you've come and, and, and how you've got there. And so many people have have gone from you know believing in certain things, not for any real compelling reason, or even there are some compelling right. evidence as to why. Right. You know, we we used to think there's luminiferous ether, which is what we thought light went through because right. light acts as a wave. It's and a all wave. It we has know to have a medium. Has right? a medium. <laughs> yeah. But we've it's discovered obvious. now that it's a particle and a wave, and it has these dual properties. And so, older established. Um, paradigms are able to be pushed aside because we're still yearning for a better understanding mm -hmm. of stuff we might already know. And that's one thing that if, if any of you have seen Cosmos, it is about continual oh. exploration and about our place in the cosmos. It's, we're not some separate bystander just looking out at it. We're in the middle of it. The, the same chemical makeup that, that, that Nicole and I and the rest of you are made up are the same thing throughout our solar system. And we can see the, the similarities with our star, the sun, and we use those to compare other stars. So we know that there's so many connections we can make from just here on earth through our different planets and the solar system and our galaxy and galaxy clusters. We're all connected in that sense, but we can learn about ourselves by looking out into the universe mm -hmm. and seeing how things came to be and how amazingly intricate and fragile we are because the universe goes on. Life doesn't necessarily go on, but the universe does. And yeah. we can appreciate what we do have, this, this life that we do have, and try to understand more about it and how it really plays a role in our lives. Yeah. I wish I had... Uh... I didn't know we were doing this this morning when I left the house, but I would have worn my, my Surly Ramex necklace. This is 100% star stuff on it. Yes. Uh, she made a whole bunch of Carl Sagan Day-related Surleys a while back uh, that are really fun. Amy um, is awesome. Yay, we love Amy. Yay. Uh, I want to point out a couple comments. Um, James Hanney says, the full audio of the events that you were at uh, is, is as well as excerpts are all on this week's Planetary Radio at planetary.org. Yes. So it sounds like they got the audio um, posted for that. Uh, we were talking, about the, talking with them earlier this week about that. Mm -hmm. um, they got the audio posted at Planetary Radio for that event, which I am going to put in my feed. Um, uh, and Matt Kaplan was a fantastic host. Um, excellent. It was a great way, just wonderful questions that was asked as far as transitions going on. So I'm really glad that... Uh, that planetary radio was able to get the the audio from the entire panel put up, even though there were some glitches with the visual. We we did get the audio, and if Good. you do get the chance, go to planetary.org and listen to it. It's about an hour and a half long, but it's 
it's so worth it. You get totally. to hear from people that have worked with Professor Sagan as well as who have had their scientific careers molded by the works that he's done. So definitely go to the Planetary Society and become a member if you'd like too. They're wonderful people doing wonderful things and their boss is Bill Nye. Who, who doesn't love that? Right? <laughs> the original bow ties are cool. That's right. <laughs> no oh, fez though. No, no fez. fez. We uh, also uh, from Emily uh, who's watching on YouTube. I love Carl. He's so inspiring. I watched Cosmos in sixth grade and was hooked. No one at my school knew who Carl Sagan was, so I went on a Cosmos marathon and read all his books. It's awesome. That is um, awesome. Cosmos is all on Hulu now, so you can watch it for free, and and that's fa I have the DVD set, of course. That's great. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get the DVD set too because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it. A lot. I mean, there's a lot of the science that we've learned since then that you know can be added to it, obviously. Um, but it has held up pretty well. I mean, just his his presentation style, I, I love, and yeah. and it's it's. I, I still watch it, and I found out a little while ago that my boyfriend had never seen it, and I was like, oh, we're fixing this. Sacrilege! How could you have not ever seen Cosmos? Our brother, he said over to his. <laughs> Definitely not giving me a ring now. You can watch this. <laughs> we did not till you sit. Like, but there will be a new version coming out. Um, yes. You know, Andrienne and and Neil deGrasse Tyson are working on a an updated version of Cosmos. So it's going to have all the updated, awesome cosmology and, and galactic evolution stuff that we've learned uh, since the original airing. Yeah, uh, it's, it's actually cool. Seth MacFarlane from, oh, that's from right. Family Guy and American mm -hmm. Dad are working with it. And it's going to be on Fox. So it's going to be on network television during primetime, which is wonderful. Not that I have that's a television, but yay! Yay! <laughs> Well, we'll, well, you can go to you can that. go to someone's house and watch it. Exactly. I, yes. Well, which I, I think is important when when they were at, at Planet Fest um, during the the Curiosity landing when Andrew and um, Carl's widow mm -hmm. and Seth MacFarlane were there. It's it was very important to both of them to make sure it gets to the biggest audience possible. Yeah. Is that yeah? There's many documentaries throughout you know all of cable shows and on the internet, but majority of people watch network television. And so mm -hmm. getting that out to a large audience and getting them excited about the newer discoveries and connecting them back to the old knowledge that we've known has, has stood the test of time. That there's things you can watch in the original Cosmos from 1980 that are still true now and we now just know more details about. And it's it was it was amazing getting to see them up on stage and then run over to JPL for the for the landing, but you know Anne has definitely um, kept kept Carl alive mm -hmm. in in the in the sense that his works are still moving on and she wants to keep his legacy going on with the with the Cosmos series and advocating for for just for science, for trying to get people interested and to love science in the way that Carl did. Uh, one quote that I I saw up here on, on Google Plus, it's Samir Hariri. Hariri, I, I hope that's right. Um, it's, we are the legacy of 15 billion years of cosmic evolution. We have a, we have a choice. We can en enhance life and come to know the universe that made us or we can squander our 15 billion year heritage in meaningless self-destruction. What happens in the first second of the next cosmic year depends on what we do here and now with our intelligence and our knowledge of the cosmos. And uh, Samer uh, continues on saying, this is my favorite quotes by Carl Sagan, puts me in perspective that there are bigger and better things we as a species could do or could be doing. And I completely agree, you know, 15 billion years that, that we've been along and we could squander it in minutes. You know, when, mm -hmm. when the cold war was happening, we could literally have destroyed every, you know, every last human on earth and not have been able to leave a legacy except for the fact that we killed ourselves. And it's important now, you know, we have Voyager that's now leaving the solar system where professor Sagan had such a, a huge impact on as far as choosing the music that went on the plates and mm -hmm. and being on the development of and it's leaving our solar system we have something that has come from the human race that is now leaving our star system and is going to go out into who knows where 
And if there is intelligent life out there, which I am not saying that there is, but if there is and that's found, that's something where even if humanity for some reason is no longer here, there is still proof that we were, that we existed. Yes. And we have reached out into the universe to try to try to say hello, even if there's no one there on the other end. Yeah. Veeger. Sorry, I just thought back to the first Star Trek movie. Woo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh. Um, I'm trying to see if there were any. There was also a quote here. Oh, from Georgia. <laughs> uh, Georgia works. Uh, she's the formal education lead for CosmoQuest. Uh, we are the universe made manifest, trying to figure itself out from Babylon 5, <laughs> which is, is sounds like it's, it's quite closely based on uh, Carl Sagan's similar quote about how we are the universe, you know, trying to, to figure itself out, yes. um, which is also from Cosmos. Um, and it's amazing. Oh, Ulysses. Hi, Ulysses. Uh, it says, uh, the science has changed so much. It's, inter it's interesting how much we've learned since, you know, thanks to the Hubble telescope and, and since mm -hmm. the airing of Cosmos in such a short time. Um, the, the, the 15 billion year quote, of course, Carl wasn't around for the, you know, the, the actual pinning down of the age of the universe to 13.7. Um, it was, it was still a big plus or minus a few billion years at, at the right. time. Uh, Wait, was it, isn't it a few billion years? Not billions and billions. billions. I'm not even going to, it's, I can't, that <laughs> I just can't. I feel I, like it's, I, I'm shaming his memory trying to do it with my squeaky little girl voice. I <laughs> <laughs> but I actually, so I, I taught a class um, at, when I was at UVA on, uh, uh, called Life, uh, Life in the Universe or Life Beyond, yeah. Life Beyond Earth. Um, and, and occasionally there would there'd be some concept or something that I, I, I couldn't explain as well as, as Carl Sagan could, so I would like insert a two or three minute video of him from Cosmos in my lecture. <laughs> I, I do I the same thing. This, but Carl Sagan can do it better, you know? Just put in the little, the, the short clip of him saying it and then go into detail. The uh, <laughs> second week of class, I showed the cosmic calendar from, from Cosmos. I'm like, yes. you know what? It, Carl does it much better than I. Just watch this. This yeah. is awesome. I'm gonna turn my webcam because we have the cosmic calendar on our door. Uh, yes. See that. Oh, it's actually on my office door. We have the cosmic calendar. So we are nerds here at CosmoQuest. Yay! <laughs> oh, and it, even think about it as a calendar. You know, which I think is a, a very effective tool for communicating this idea. But we think you know, we go through a calendar each year, and yeah. a year is long to us. But breaking down the eons and eons into days and realizing that humans have been here for fractions of seconds, it's insane to think about that and what happened before us and what led up to us being here. And just the amazing feats of physics and understanding that we can actually unravel those mysteries. We can actually learn about about the, the physics of space. We can yeah. look at astrophys astrophysics and understand how, how our solar system formed and what happened with our star and how other stars are coming about, realizing that we're just, we can actually rewind the clock and seeing what happened periodically. And then we have the Hubble Space Telescope that's able to visually look back in time and see these baby galaxies as, as galaxies first started to form in the universe. And it, it's, it's amazing being able to take images of that just mm -hmm. because light has a limit on how fast it can go. And so that means that far away, we can actually see light from nearly the beginning of the universe and what was going on then. It, it's, it still blows my mind thinking that I can see yeah. so close to the beginning of the universe, visually see. And, you know, I've, it's 2012 and the universe isn't going to die but it's or at least not in 2012 yeah but don't let's not let's not <laughs> let's not but, encourage uh, that but you know we're, we're here now and 14 billion years ago and we can almost see that mm -hmm. that it's amazing is absolutely crazy with radio telescopes unrelated to carl sagan i actually before i came here um i was I was visiting family in New York, and I had I, I knew that the the telescope that had 
that was used to discover the cosmic microwave background was in Jersey, but I had no idea. Like, I knew Bell Labs was in New Jersey, but I had no idea how close it was. Like, 30 minutes from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I got my car and put it into Google and showed up. Uh, it's on private property. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> but uh, I actually did visit the telescope. Um, Oh. Was, you discover the cosmic microwave background, the big horn with the pigeon poop. Yep. Yes, so uh, I was very happy. For Everyone, that. the poop reference has arrived. Thank you, YouTube. I've cool. officially made a poop reference <laughs> that is scientifically appropriate for the discussion. For those not I'm done. aware of the poop reference, is the when they first were hearing, seeing the static coming on Same. in their image, they they thought that it was excrement from pigeons. So they went out there and scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed, and, scrubbed, and it was still there afterwards. And that's when we discovered the micro cosmic Pen microwave Penzias background. and Wilson. Yeah, actually, um, I sat – so the, this T-shirt's from the Green Bank Observatory. I sat in the lounge in Green Bank uh, where the Drake Equation, they came up with it, um, listening to Bob Wilson tell the pigeon poop story. I was just like, <laughs> Nobel Prize, nerdgasm, okay. <laughs> 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 These things happen when you're in astronomy. You randomly have a Nobel Prize winner chatting with you in, in the... Uh... <laughs> so even though I've never gotten to meet Carl Sagan, I did get to meet Bob Wilson. It was very fantastic. Very nice. Yeah. And uh, Georgia Bracey, because we love you, Georgia, does uh, make another comment um, that one of the best known from Cosmos, and actually a song's been made of it, you know, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch... You must first invent the universe, <laughs> showing that, yes, we have all come, and the makeup that makes up every one of us, all of our subatomic particles, had this original source, and it's just how you put them together. It's just like baking a pie, just on very tiny, tiny levels. And I, I think pies taste better. I've never had human, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Did we just go there? <laughs> I think I just made a cannibalism reference. You just Sorry. Went to cannibalism. Awesome. But apple awesome. pies are delicious. But the the, the point is, is that <laughs> I'm tired, and we're we're all made of the same star stuff. We the the heavy elements that are on Earth had to have come from an exploding supernova. It had to have come from that. It's the only way that the right. nucleosynthesis could ha could happen. So we have can all trace our origins back to previous phenomena up into the Big Bang, which is as far back as we can look right now. And so we speculate, but we, from that point, we can see the hydrogen, the helium, and a little bit of lithium because the universe is kind of crazy and it needs it. So it's taken those light atoms and become a little bit more complicated and complex through the furnace of a star. Yeah, and, and when you say from scratch, you don't actually mean from scratch unless you've created the Big Bang yourself. So yes. just buy, buy the pie crust at the store. It's not even worth it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the lesson I take from it, but hey, that's just me. <laughs> um, I wanted to point out, uh, James Haney commented that Cosmos, in addition to being available on Hulu, is available on YouTube. And along with the Sagan series with NASA, so there's a number of interviews. Um, he does a for there's a forum with Carl Sagan, Arthur C. Clarke, and Stephen Hawking. So that sounds uh, really cool. If you could post a link to that, if you have that, that'd be cool. But yeah, um, that is definitely something else to watch. Um, and uh, oh, oh, and Nancy uh, wanted to share her favorite Carl Sagan quote. Uh, not an exact quote. This is uh, the phrasing is close. Uh, there have been thousands of worlds that decided not to pursue pursue exploration and they left no enduring legacy um and that's that's a possibility it, uh, that comes out of the the drake equation so it's right. the drake equation <laughs> when you talk about the possibility of finding uh intelligent life out in the universe um it's possible that there were other worlds and we just never heard from them absolutely and it's there's just so much out there and we know that there's no feasible way for us to know everything that's out there but we should try you know, we know so very little. We we point a telescope up into the night sky and see so very little. But if more of us do it, we're able to see more and more. We can become human interferometers, which is awesome. <laughs> and I'll for you transform. <laughs> <laughs> now, Nicole, do you have do you have a specific quote of Carl's that's really impacted your life? Um, not so much a quote, but uh, I think. 
just the, uh, a section of Demon Haunted World that impacted me, and I, I'm really bad at pulling out quotes because I'm like, I like this whole thing. I just have to have the whole thing. Um, right. But there's a section in Demon Haunted World where he talked uh, specifically about how um, with uh, alien abductees, you know, um, this is going back to his belief at one point in UFOs and whatnot, and 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 my own, uh, the fact that it is a phenomenon to take seriously because you know either extraterrestrials are abducting people and probing them and doing horrible things, and that's a really bad thing, and we need to do something about it. You have a or bad time. What is more likely is, I mean, people think that they're going through a, a very difficult and traumatic experience, and this is still something that needs to be dealt with. Um, right. Not shunned or made fun of, but uh, an issue that has to be dealt with with compassion. Um, and that, so that 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 whole section... <laughs> I'm bad at quotes. That whole section really stuck with me uh, and inspired me in a way I, I never thought of. Oh, absolutely. I mean, thinking about the, the human connection in there is that even if it's not a true depiction of what happened, mm -hmm. if it's real to them, then there's something going on that needs to be addressed. And yeah. at the end of the day, we we can spot off and be mean all we want to the the crazies, but like we me. still share yes, <laughs> like us both. But we still share that same connection, the fact that we are all human. Mm -hmm. We do need to, to help each other out every once in a while. And sometimes if you're going through a really rough time, you, you need someone to reach out and connect. And I believe that, that Carl did a great job of saying, yeah, we, we could shun them. And we could say, you know, oh, you're an idiot. You have no idea. You have no connection with reality. But that's not going to help anybody want to understand what the truth is or right. what truth we have available to us to further along our understanding. So I, I think that's really important when it comes to, especially with you and I being um, involved in the skeptic community is that it's really easy to get frustrated and it's really easy to act on that frustration. And sometimes, yeah, yeah it, you're going to be frustrated, but not acting on it and, and approaching in the way that, you know, there's a reason why this person believes it. And that's not a reason to treat them less than human because their humanity is not in question. It's just the reason why they believe something that is. And sometimes the best question you can ask is why do you believe that? Yeah. The, the yeah. explanation in and of itself, that's one thing I, I remember. Um, and speaking of Carl was that he would just ask why, well, why do you believe that have him, or excuse me, have them explain it to him. And sometimes just the act of explaining something causes them to think outside of, wait, wait, maybe this doesn't make sense, or maybe I haven't gone down this path that could explain it in a different way. It's like the, it, I think we can say, Carl Sagan is the original, don't be a dick. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say it right so, now. Sorry, Will and Phil, but <laughs> I, I might have been Carl. Sagan has you beat. <laughs> uh, this is another quote um, from Ashwin uh, watching on YouTube. Somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Um, and then if you're on Google Plus or on YouTube, people are sharing links um, and so we'll have to compile those at the end as well. Definitely. To post. Uh, do you have a favorite quote, Scott? I, I do. And actually, I had the opportunity to share it at the after event from the um, from the Crawford Family Forum event in Pasadena. We had a Sagan slam. So we all, all, all left and went and got together and had Cosmos because we're nerds. And... <laughs> We we shared We're nerds um, and lushes. We had nerds and lushes. That's right. <laughs> but we we got to share um, things that that Carl has done that has really impacted our lives personally. And the the one that I shared is um, the cosmos is all that is that is or ever was or ever will be. Our feeblest contemplations of the cosmos stir us. There's a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory of falling from a height. We know we're approaching the greatest of mysteries. And t to me, we're, we're in this. The cosmos is everything. We're in it. It was before us and it's going to be on after I'm gone, unless I live forever. But <laughs> even the, the most basic questions of the cosmos is something that is profound. And 
was able to discuss is that I haven't always been involved in planetary sciences. I haven't always been involved with astronomy. I started my career in emergency medical services and a firefighter. I, so kind of on a different path. <laughs> but there were still those times where I was able to look up into the night sky and just be curious, not really know what I was wondering because I just looked up and was mesmerized. And there's those times when we've all had that first look of Saturn through a telescope. Mm. And you know, the, those photons came from the sun, bounced off of Saturn, and they're hitting your eyeball and just your eyeball. And that first time you actually get to see it and see that it's something that's not just a dot, but there's shape and there's form and it's complex and it's dynamic. And that's really close to us. That's very, very, very close to us. Using that as a scale on just how big everything else is and what else we need to know and discover, it, it, it kind of stuck with me. And so that, that feeble contemplation that I had where I wasn't thinking in scientific terms, I was going, you know, about my day, not really concerning just myself with Just saving lives, science. you know. Just, you know, just saving babies. <laughs> <No big deal. laughs> Just saving babies. That's it. <laughs> but um, but it's it is still something that's stirring. And as as much as I did enjoy my my previous career, and as, as rewarding as it was, I do find more personal reward out of being able to explore all of the universe. <laughs> Sorry, humans. I love the universe more. <laughs> um, but some of you humans are awesome, and I love you. But it, it, to me, I think it's just the act of being curious is what's so very important. It's something that I have a, a passion and aspiration for that I want to inflict upon you. I, I want you, you to chase that curiosity. I want you to embrace that curiosity and see where that path takes you. Because you, you'll end up places that you've never imagined. And I'm glad of where it's taken me how we can make poop jokes together. Yes. <laughs> Science has brought us together to make poop jokes. That is yeah, true. I'm, I'm the opposite of Carl Sagan. I just go silly. There's nothing <laughs> profound about me. <laughs> um, uh, another uh, comment uh, from Mukau is uh, a reminder to check out the Symphony of Science videos uh, yes. song. So, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, first one that he made, um, Melody Sheep is his YouTube handle um, yes. was uh, starts off with the apple pie quote it's uh, glorious dawn and so it's the, the chorus it's it's it's, I, it's it's if you haven't already seen it this explanation is going to sound silly but it's like auto-tuned scientists yes, yes it <laughs> saying is. awesome stuff about the universe um, and, and I highly recommend the symphony of science I know he's got an album out and John Boswell is pretty awesome John Boswell um, is awesome yeah they, I met, they actually I'm, played that at the Crawford family forum did they Yes, they did, nice. and, and along with um, retelling of Androian's response to it, because okay. obviously, yeah, I remember in, that. in an yeah. age of litigation and, yeah. and and copyright infringement and things like that, they were kind of worried at first that there was going to be a huge backlash about it, and there was from people that weren't her, but she actually said, like, no, Carl would have loved it. this. Yeah. She would have loved this. I'm glad. And she talked about John Boswell, about how great it was that mm -hmm. someone is taking the amazing words that Carl said and is bring it to a new audience. Yeah. If, if you guys don't have um, that album, you can actually get it from Melody Sheep, from John Boswell. It's uh, melodysheep.bandcamp.com. And you can actually get that, that album. It's awesome. Yeah. He's not paying us to say any of this. It genuinely is amazing. Yeah, it, I listen yeah. to it all the time. <laughs> it really is. It, it's it's nerdy and awesome and it gets you to get and you beautiful. To yeah. Well. It is. Friend of mine, uh, when I met John Boswell at the Sagan Day event a couple of years ago, I, I said, you know, one of these days I'm going to do a belly dance to Glorious Dawn. And I never did because I suck at it. But my friend <laughs> Jennifer Jackson, who's fantastic and lives in Charlottesville, uh, actually did a, um, a a belly dance choreography with with sword I think or veil I can't remember um, to glorious dawn and it was it was fantastic there's not video of it sorry it was live oh. only <laughs> but there has been a belly dance interpretation of glorious dawn and it was uh, really amazing so <laughs> so you need to have her do it again yes. I will not do belly dances for anyone else never ever I, I will hmm. I will it will hurt people's eyeballs. Double A S. <laughs> we can <No>. teach you. <laughs> oh. No. 
So right. we're we're coming up at the end of our science hour, but you know, if anyone has any last last comments on there, uh, we really appreciate all all of your comments and your retelling of how Carl has really impacted your life, and we appreciate you bearing with us as uh, this is very last minute and come together, <laughs> but we. We still we love to be able to to talk with all of you and hear on how science is is really uh, affecting your life in in any way whether we're talking about our Cosmic Quest Citizen Science Projects or the virtual star parties or just finding out some awesome things that are going on in science it it does affect us all and I think the the way that we can better understand it is if we all are able to discuss and, and converse on it. So I definitely appreciate your questions and comments that are out there throughout all of our broadcasts and keep them coming. Do you have anything you want to add, Nicole, before we say um, goodbye? That's all I have. Um, I, I do want to put in a quick plug for the Virtual Skeptics podcast, which is starting as a Google Hangout right now. So awesome. as we wrap up, if you're interested in listening to the Virtual Skeptics, uh, they're a really fun podcast with um, weekly updates on skeptical news topics, and they're fun and cool. Uh, so if you're already on Google+, Plus as it is, go over. Uh, they're about to start live. So that's uh, the only thing I have for this week. Um, yeah, thanks for hanging out with us. And putting up with our silliness, we promise there will be more silliness coming in its own time slot. Yes. We will not <laughs> be taking over the science hour with our silliness all the time. But uh, there is there is in the works. There is a Scott and Nicole silliness coming. <laughs> of, of doom. <laughs> of doom. Get our crap together. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, well, thank you guys. I w uh, I'll collect the URLs of, of the videos and stuff you guys have been suggesting. Um, and post them. And for anyone who watched the Virtual Star Party on Sunday, I also promised to collect the URLs of the stuff we talked about, because we talked about um, astronomy documentaries, and I will collect those and post those Great. as well. So. And I will be returning to the Virtual Star Parties this Sunday. My, my internet at the new place will be installed on Friday, so I will be able to join you and Yay. look at the universe together. So. Excellent. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, we will see you... I think our next broadcast is... Tomorrow? Thursday? Thursday. No, which is no. The Hangout is on hiatus. That's right. But stay so, tuned. Sunday. Sunday is a virtual star party around, I want to say, 6.37 Pacific time. We will make events and make sure it gets shared out. So everyone have uh, a yeah. yeah, we'll post the event. <laughs> right. Everyone have a great night. Bye.